Last time on Final Fantasy, we looked at the PS1 trilogy, why 7 and 8 are great, why 9 is almost great, and today we move forward into what might be my favorite game in the series, 10, and two flawed, fascinating entries with 11 and 12. So, welcome to part four of our Final Fantasy main series analysis, the PS2 trilogy. At the end of this remarkable stretch of games is Final Fantasy X. For many critics, Final Fantasy X is the series crossing the threshold into design that's unmistakably modern even decades later. Voice acting, level design that replaces the high-flying overworld with linear hallways, and the immaculate fidelity of the PlayStation 2, a line that might sound facetious, except that, yeah, PlayStation 2 is a look, and the original PS2 version of Final Fantasy X remains the best the game has ever looked. Final Fantasy X also happened to be the final game I played for this retrospective. Not for any particular reason, and it's surprising because this is maybe the easiest and cheapest Final Fantasy game to get. I can go buy 5 PS2 copies of X for $30 right now, but when I sat down with X, the code to my journey through the series, I was transported back to the distant realms of 2003, a time that exists only in the fossils of my memory. Released in 2001, Final Fantasy X is quintessential PS2 core. The technological advances of video game computing power and DVD magic fused with the distinctly polygonal game graphics that defined early 3D gaming, even into the PS2 era. The magic of this era survives, crystallized in Final Fantasy X, and the game plays fresh even 20 years later because of how much glee it takes in integrating the tools of the new millennium with rudimentary powers of the old video game world. During the game's opening stretch, Tin uses dynamic camera movements and voiceover narration as the player moves through the opening level. 8 took advantage of a dynamic camera and voiceover during pre-rendered cutscenes or when it used untagged stream of consciousness dialogue. Because Tin is fully voiced, it can't create the same Faulknerian effect as 8's interwoven speakers, so instead its narration draws attention to the unseen changes in its hero, Titus. Like Joe Gillis in Sunset Boulevard, Titus narrates Ten after his death, beyond the physical confines of a body, as a soul free to introspect the way he didn't get to in life. I think I had a dream. A dream of being alone. I wanted someone, anyone, beside me. So I didn't have to feel alone anymore. For all the semi-deserved criticism Ten gets for its shabby early PS2 voice acting, the ear is immediately drawn to the somber, wise reflection in Titus's narration compared to his impulsive and arrogant past self. Death is humbling. We will see this idea later reprised in 15, but in 10, the transition from life to death is central. Titus, the star player for Blitzball's Xanark and Abes, a team I can only assume as a proxy for the evil empires of the past Yankees and present Dodgers, is yoinked out of time to the land of Spira, where Sin, a giant kaiju, roams and destroys towns and cities. With Sin comes death, and with death comes the Summoners, a group of priests and priestesses that train to defeat Sin and to ferry the souls of the dead. Yuna, the summoner whose story we follow in Ten, and who's meant to be a martyr to stop Sin, sends the souls of those killed by Sin to the afterlife in one of the defining cutscenes of the early PS2 era. Titus observes, People die and Yuna dances. When will she stop dancing? When will it stop? We people of the future, blessed with knowledge of 10 too, know that this observation isn't true in the end, but that's not important. Titus's inner thoughts here are a requiem for a future that might not be possible. Sin has been destroyed before, and will be destroyed again and always returns. Even the name itself, Sin, gives it an eternal nature. But sin, as personified in Ten, isn't an elusive, ethereal idea. Sin may be the manifest hatred and wrath of humanity, but every incarnation of sin that ravages spirit is the embodiment of an individual. 
The sin that the player wages war against is the embodiment of Jacked, Titus's alcoholic, abusive father who ran the gamut from calling Titus Rizless, ridiculing him, and ultimately abandoning him. Jacked as sin provides a human core to an inhuman monster and also allows for a spiritual path to overcome sin beyond the physical sacrifice given by Yuna and all past summoners. When Titus awakes in Spira, he finds a world that's bound to a complex system of religious power structures and the summoners that they control. Spira is as besieged by the power structures of Yevon and their ambitions of total theocratic control and oppression of the Albed people as it is by Sin. The Albed are an ethnic group whose technology and religion is viewed as heretical, and throughout the game, the relationship that Yevon and the world and the party have to the Albed is explored more thoroughly than the world's relationship to Sin. This difference is important. Because the world has a simplistic view of sin, they will destroy it at any cost necessary, an inordinate amount of focus is given towards the complex relationship between Yevon and the Albed. Yevon emphasizes a simplistic fear and hatred of sin above, and a complex, twisted fear and hatred of the Albed below to maintain their structural power within Spira. Titus, by coming to Spira as a total outsider, is a metaphorical fish out of literal water and is able to view Sin and the Albed outside of Yevon's social order. Titus's personal connection to Sin and Jekt makes his relationship more complicated than how Yevon and the other party members view Sin. The simplistic and violent approach that Yevon takes towards Sin isn't able to permanently defeat Sin, because warfare and human sacrifice are incapable of overcoming the eternity of Sin. The summoning that temporarily destroys Sin upholds the religious structures while also killing the summoner themselves. To defeat Sin, a deeper piety must be discovered that goes beyond the violence and the death that Sin itself perpetuates and goes beyond upholding man-made religious structures. Yuna, as a summoner, has resigned herself to death. One of the game's powerful scenes is when Titus learns that Yuna is going to die and is shocked by how glib everyone else in the party, Yuna included, is to this. This scene occurs relatively late into the game and reinforces just how locked down Spira is into its Sisyphean routines. Compared to the other characters in the series that have a strong relationship with their own death, Yuna is the most resigned. I had said previously that what separates heroes from villains in Final Fantasy is a willingness to die, but Yuna pushes this to an extreme. She is resigned to death, even knowing that, in the end, her death won't do much. Even more so, everyone else in the party, Waka, Orin, Lulu, Kamari, are stunned by Titus's defiance. For Yuna herself, much of her demure, passive attitude comes from adopting expectations Yevon and Spear in society has placed on the summoners to be these humble, pious creatures. Comparing Yuna from the start of the journey to the end, we see how she, like the water she guides, fits the vessel needed of her until she discovers, much like Squall and Kuja before her, the value of her own life and personality, leading her, ultimately, to becoming a silly little gremlin in Ten Two, which is a goal all of us can aspire to. Yuna's arc in Ten is a reverse Freudian development, where she goes from acting strictly on the needs and demands of the society around her, to becoming more independent, more open to the pleasure and wants of her id. She doesn't abdicate her responsibility entirely. If she did go full-on Freud pleasure principle, Sin probably survives because anyone's subconscious drive in response to fighting a giant kaiju is... Fuck that. Yuna learns to untether herself from the oppressive chains of Yevon without receding all the way into becoming a misanthropic libertine. For Titus, the death of Yuna, the specter that haunts him, the angel in his nightmares opposite the Jektian devil, drives him to find an alternative path to perpetuating the cycle of sin, even as everyone else accepts this eternal cycle. Titus's quest to permanently defeat sin while saving Yuna's life is initially a selfish quest, scoffed at by the other characters. How could it not be seen this way? Martyrdom is something worshipped. It defines legacies and the upholding of power structures, no matter how caustic and harmful to the world as a whole they may be, is viewed as an integral part of the social contract. It would be absurd to throw these ideas out entirely, but an unyielding fealty to martyrdom and to protecting a system that demands that martyrdom is what lets the party view Yuna, to a certain extent, as completely disposable. They care for her, but her death is what's needed to keep Spira going, to keep Yevon's domination in place, and to protect the fragile social order threatened daily by sin. Titus, this weird, corny outsider attempting to break this cycle, is at once obscene because 
who the hell does this goofy ass isekai protagonist think he is to be coming in here and trying to up into society and religious practices he knows nothing about but he's also what they need a view that can see beyond the limits of a society and tear down that old broken order maybe this wasn't such a good idea after all Titus's ignorance is the wisdom needed to change the party's view of Yevon and Seymour, a powerful Yevon Meister, from one of grand moral opulence to what Percy Shelley calls the dregs of their dull race. Although he is wiser in his deathly narration, his drive during the present tense action of Final Fantasy X is his romance with Yuna. My first exposure to Final Fantasy X was similar to my early exposure to VIII. Primarily ridicule from people outraged by the games being built around romances. It's gay. Ten's romance between Titus and Yuna isn't as central to the story as Squall and Renoa's romance is to Eight, but it's important for that full-bodied experience. The moment Yuna and Titus fall in love, a love scene that will come again in 16, is one of the series' highlights and one of the best moments of its era. This is the new aesthetic power available in the DVD era of gaming, and its impressionistic fantasia makes it a beautiful counterpoint to the spare minimalism of Eight's space scene. In his review of the entire mainline Final Fantasy series, Never Knows Best argues that this scene is emotionally manipulative, and while his video is awesome and I wholly recommend it, I cannot abide by this point. In general, I'm not a fan of most critiques that claim a work is emotionally manipulative, because having one's emotions manipulated is the exchange between art and viewer. The meta-knowledge of the emotions a scene is creating, and the refusal to feel those emotions because one doesn't want to give oneself over to the art is, in my estimation, a skill issue, in most cases. Whether or not a scene is effective for a given viewer requires deeper interrogation than the emotionally manipulative label, you may as well say that you don't like coke because it's a drink. For me, the romance of the scene and its imagery were deeply moving. Its poetic impressionism is rare in this medium, and I savor every bit of it. The popular framing of video games by news media and by many gamers themselves as this inherently masculine medium makes this era of Final Fantasy so much more exciting. Despite all the Tifa titties and Fran Ash shots and Lulu chess gazing, Final Fantasy is a series whose storytelling flows out of the legacy of the more sensitive feminine works of literature. Jane Austen and Emily Bronte run strong in many of these games. It's hard not to see the ghost of young Heathcliff and Squall. So much of the pushback against Final Fantasies 8, 10, and later 13, along with 10 2, is directly targeted at the feminine coded elements in these stories, but it's precisely this move away from the strictly masculine design and focus of older titles that makes Final Fantasy so transcendent from 6 onwards. As much as I love Final Fantasy 4, a part of me wants to see what that game would be like if it were written with the same sensitivity as 8. It's in this deeper sensitivity, not just in gaining strength or falling in love, that Titus is able to defeat Sin. Like I had mentioned, it's easy to call Titus's desire to save Yuna selfish. After all, there is no other known way to defeat Sin, and it's, on its surface, a quest to save himself from heartbreak. But this isn't all there is to it. It's what Titus wants, but to actually defeat Sin requires much greater courage than love and friendship or whatever other tropes get carelessly dumped onto JRPGs by their least intelligent haters. Instead of subduing Sin, the monster, and lulling it to sleep, Demon Souls, Old One style, Titus confronts Jacked, his father, to defeat the idea of Sin and has to do the two hardest actions a person can do. He must say goodbye and he must forgive the unforgivable. Under no circumstance does Jack deserve forgiveness. Forgiveness is something we often think of as interchangeable with justice or karma, since forgiveness between individuals is often in response to some abuse or neglect. It's thought that forgiveness is given in exchange for some act of penance, i.e. you did something bad to me, but you can be forgiven when you do something good for me. But this kind-hearted vengeance doesn't really get to the core of forgiveness and finding peace in the wrongdoing done towards oneself. Forgiveness isn't something earned, and at its most pure level, it's independent of the person being forgiven. Forgiveness is something given by a victim to both the perpetrator and to themselves. For Titus to find the peace, the inner piety needed to overcome sin, he must forgive Jekt, because to give Jekt the hatred he has earned is to perpetuate sin. The wrath of the father becomes the wrath of the son, and the cycle will continue. For the cycle to be broken, an undeserved grace to sin and the person that personifies it must be given. 
that Titus fades away, lost to this world, that he must be the one to say goodbye to Yuna by sacrificing his physical body and ending the cycle, reinforces that the kind of strength needed to overcome a monster like Sin isn't what the structures of organized religion, especially one with the political ambitions of Yevon, can offer, since self-perpetuation is the actual goal of such organizations. Self-sacrifice, and the grace required to do so, is a recurring theme throughout the series. From Cecil's refusal to fight back against his Dark Knight self, to Eris's death, and onward into 15 and 16. That Titus's version of this comes with the ripple of forgiving a man who profoundly hurt him makes this the most difficult iteration of this theme. It's romantic to fantasize about sacrificing one's own body, but being asked to forgive is a very real, very vulnerable, and difficult experience that we, as real people, and not our fictional counterparts that populate the stories of our shared dreams, are often asked to do. Not for the sake of others, but for the sake of ourselves. The game asking Titus to forgive Jekt is a tall order, and one that challenges the player themselves. Jekt is abusive towards Titus both actively and passively. The few instances where we see them together in flashbacks are always bleak. The vibes are bad. Here's a scene where Jack tells Titus he'll never get a girl, that he has no riz, that he'll get no motion. You with a woman? You can't even catch a ball! Oh, what's the matter? Gonna cry again? Cry, cry. That's the only thing you're good for. Wow, Jack, you're just like, uh, I don't know, Hamlet? Tells his mom that Sent sure you have, else could you not have motion? I guess? Jack is so deep. Putting Titus in a situation where he has to forgive his abuser is difficult to parse through as a player. To many, this is actively distasteful. It's hard enough to get oneself or others out of abusive situations. To then have Titus's forgiveness of sin be an undeserved forgiveness of abuse seems to perpetuate the long-standing excuse that it's the responsibility of victims to love their abusers. But what's actually happening is something more profound. Titus isn't being asked to let sin continue. He's being asked to break the cycle. It's been a long time since he's seen Jekt, and he must come to terms with the stories of his father being beloved everywhere but in his own home, and he must find peace, otherwise he will kill Yuna. The hatefulness directed at Jekt will be sent back into the world unless Titus can keep it and pacify it. This is difficult to deal with because even in spaces that advocate for rehabilitative justice, there's a desire for revenge. It's common for people to think that everyone should get a second chance except for the person who wronged me. And on that personal level, it's difficult to ask someone to let go of that. But for the cycles of sin and abuse to be broken, there must be a final victim who's denied karmic justice. We also see this with Waka, the first character in Spirit to accept Titus. Waka struggles to come to terms with his brother Chapu, dying as a crusader for Yevon. On one hand, he harbors vengeance against the Albed for Chapu's death, but also resents the horrible knowledge that Chapu decided to leave him and Lulu to become a crusader. This is different from Titus's story, but like Titus, Waka has to find a closure that the world will not hand him. His hatred of the Albed has to be overcome internally, because Chapu isn't coming back. He has to let Chapu go, because it's the only way to also let go of the hatred that taints his heart and is the only way to find peace between the followers of Yevon and the Albed. Because Final Fantasy is ultimately an optimistic series, Waka does get over it before doing one of the most diabolical things any Final Fantasy character has ever done. He marries Lulu, his dead brother's fiance. Now, this is technically in 10 2, not 10, but still. All I'm saying is that Waka's wiki page starts with Waka is, while Chapu starts with Chapu was. If you want to get in the right mood to play 10, throw on Jeff Buckley's Grace, or at least I would recommend that. Except 10 had the much more inspired idea to make the final fight theme a carcass-inspired melodic death metal track that goes hard, and when Seymour, one of the game's main antagonists, yells Death Awaits during one of his boss fights, I can only think of Slayer Hell Awaits. And then there's Lulu, a heavily belted goth lady that certainly didn't resuscitate any old hangups of mine, and this game is, for all of its water and piety, metal in a way precious to the early 2000s, and I love it. 
My personal favorite shot in the game is this one, where the camera lingers on Lulu's chest for an extended period, but like the embarrassed teenage boy who couldn't ask his mom to buy Final Fantasy X 2, the camera swings around wildly and cuts to Oren, also while swinging around wildly to hide its intentions, make it look like, I don't know, art or thoughtful or something? I don't know. But perhaps what sticks with me the most about Final Fantasy X is the water. Final Fantasy X fits easily next to Pokemon Ruby and Sapphire, Super Mario Sunshine, and The Legend of Zelda The Wind Waker during the Great Water Era of video games. The ocean and the sounds of the water are the most evocative sounds on this earth, and the sixth generation was when the technology could finally capture the isolation and freedom, the loneliness and community that builds around the water. It's awesome, but... Like with all things Final Fantasy, the coastlines of Spira wouldn't last, as Final Fantasy turns back inland to the desert lands of Final Fantasy XII. Not quite yet. There are two Final Fantasy games that presented a problem for me heading into this video, which are the MMO extravaganzas 11 and 14. Because of the time sink that this genre demands, I had decided to skip these entries until I get to have a summer of 14, and I don't feel particularly qualified as a critic or a player to talk about them. I certainly don't want to fall into the trap many critics who overemphasize genre fall into where their reviews and analysis are generalized around genre hangups rather than the games themselves. I mean, it would be fitting since this is Final Fantasy and that's what every JRPG review on YouTube does, but that's not what I want to become. However, these games are numbered entries, and I believe dutiful viewers and Final Fantasy fanatics who've made it this far will want to hear some thoughts and analysis about these games that themselves have incredibly dedicated followings. It's the only fair thing to do for these games. So to cover them, I've brought along friend of the channel and Final Fantasy fake mega fan Vivian Aladrin on the line to talk about 11 and 14. Hi, uh, hello. One of the most interesting forms, the ephemeral nature of art in a medium tainted by a capitalist impulse is the massively multiplayer online role-playing RPG, and Final Fantasy is no stranger to such fascinations. There is no way to truly revisit the history of such games as they were, even World of Warcraft Classic cannot truly re-grasp what it was like to be a child in 2004 trying to make sense of the sweeping world of Azeroth while random strangers on the internet yell slurs at you. But there is something captivating in Final Fantasy XI, a game that was released in 2002 Two, and as recently as 2023 had gotten new content. This game has existed for over 20 years, and it shows, far from the sleek polish of a revamped FF14, Eleven bears the bones of its history shamelessly. Combat is sticky and unintuitive. There's a process to change from one target to another. There's a process to invite party members. There's a process to unlock other processes to unlock gear that will themselves require processes to upgrade into meta relevancy. And yet, FF11 is unrecognizable on some level to its origin. It creates this kind of bizarre fixation. Every step you make in the world of an ADL feels mechanically like archaeology, like walking through a clean slice of video game history. And even though that is, strictly speaking, false, this sensation comes through because no one makes MMOs like this anymore. Let's set the scene a little. You are an adventurer, arriving in one of the three city-states that start the game. Windhurst, home of the Tarotaro and Mithra, uh, the terrifying children race and the cat girls respectively. Bastok, home of the Humes and the Galka, humans and um, shark boys, I guess. And Sandoria, home of the Elvan, uh, elves, if you couldn't guess. The game places you down, gives you a couple lines of context about this town, points you at an NPC, gives you a ticket, and then from there you're basically on your own. 
a lot of the initial functionality of the game is locked behind your capacity to figure out that in order to give NPCs items, you have to target them, open your system menu, hit the trade button to open a trade option with the NPC where you then select one of these windows, which will then open up your item menu, which you then scroll through and select the item you want to give to them, then hit confirm, and then, congratulations, you have completed the act of giving the ticket to the NPC. Congrats on the free 50 gil. I'm never one to get too into talking mechanics in any games, but FF11 really compels you to fixate on it mechanically, mostly because it is built on a system that predates famous MMO World of Warcraft, things that seem so intuitive and sensible as instanced dungeons with specific bosses and loot exist but they exist in a way that's practically unrecognizable. You basically only know that a certain area is or isn't a dungeon by merit of whether or not you're allowed to ride your mount in it. They can have home points, survival guides, both, neither, and there are bosses in the sense that they're notorious monsters out in the world at large, but the effect of traversing this world makes the spawning of big, imposing, scary enemies feel commonplace. Uh, okay, another example. Levels. like. Like, leveling up. The idea of an MMO giving you a level cap to gate endgame content, a cap that progressively scales up as each new expansion comes out, seems so obvious. And yet, as far as I could tell, the cap started at 50, at some point was raised in the span of a single expansion to 75, then in the process of the release uh, schedule of Wings of the Goddess, scaled up five levels at a time to level 99, where it rests to this day with the final expansion Seekers of Adeline being built entirely without an added new level cap. Though they do cheat this by finally introducing item levels, what would now be a staple in the genre. This feeling of FF11 as a frontier into a new world is a brutal double-edged sword, though. For every moment in the game that soars, like when you figure out how skill chains work, that there are enemies that are built to be used to grind weapon skill levels, and you can essentially leave the game on overnight poking at them, figuring out that powerful weapons are gated only by the humble domain invasions, big slappy boss events where a group of players band together to obliterate the big dragon, and all your frames in the process, uh, there is also the bad. The bad can show up suddenly, but wickedly. It turns out, this dungeon you need to explore for Chains of Promethea has apex mobs, super endgame enemies that are made to grind capacity points, so like, designed that you should ideally party up at level cap and with decent equipment if you're going to tackle them, and certainly not at level 60 some odd. This particular issue is further complicated by the weird relationship the game has with its story. FF11 has a story, it has several in fact, working on the episodic nature of expansions, where Rise of the Zillard is a direct sequel to the base game's plot, and Chains of Promethea iterate on that a little further. The Treasures of Otter Gone, Wings of the Goddess, and Seekers of Adeline respectively all take place as bespoke set pieces with bespoke conflicts, save some small references to the subplots of the base game's plot from Wings of the Goddess, by virtue of it being a story where you travel 20 years into Venetiel's past. Due to this episodic nature, and the fact that in balancing new level caps and content that intersects with older areas, the game broadly allows you to approach the story at your own pace, and that can make it hard to follow. Flitting from storyline to storyline as more of it opens up to you relative to your level and gear, which is a shame because the stories can be interesting to witness. Even the least interesting of them reveal a kind of brave curiosity in exploring the MMO as a vehicle for narrative. It may seem odd to consider such things after the popularity of FF14 built in large part on the back of its remarkably strong narrative, but remember that this is an MMO that was made without jumping as a meaningful, mechanical way to interact with the world. The game struggles to know what to do with you, and instead of being timeless and classy like Bopper, I come to you now with some Jazz Age filth. You are the Nick Carraway of Vanadiel, quietly gay and deeply judgmental of this bizarre world you've somehow ended up a total stranger in, despite all evidence to suggest that you are as natural a part of this place as anyone else. You take on the prototypical stock MMO hero role that would be largely popularized by big names like World of Warcraft, the muscle that's also here. 
your involvement in the story tends towards the circumstantial. A city-state sends you on menial everyman tasks until you accidentally stumble upon a plot that runs deeper than your pay grade, but it endears you to the powers that be, so much so that before you know it, you're in the show-stopping block party for fiends and monsters, Gatsby's Delkfoot Tower, rescuing diplomats while Juno tries to figure out if there's anything to be done about the Shadow Lord. See, alongside your contributions of heroic errand boy or cat, or shark, rests a litany of heroes, all of whom hold interesting, flawed lives, and by nature of the game's loose association with storytelling, one that almost trends towards naturalism by letting the cast have an interiority that f feels like you don't have any access to. These characters' lives feel more like glimpses. Lion is a legendary hero, but in the 2024 era of scuffed digital archaeology, we meet her, and it seems like it's barely any time at all in the grand scheme of walking from place to place for mobs to level grind on before she's giving up her life to save the world from the hell that Eldnar should wrought. See, this may be the inevitable part of any modern analysis of this game from someone who wasn't there to see the courage of man fail. Any modern exploration of Final Fantasy XI is the quintessential experience of digital archaeology. You are the Nick Carraway of your Nick Carraway, witnessing a world that has been maintained entirely by the insider. Progressing through any story in this game inevitably yields a vertical slice of a vibrant, decomposing log that is this game, an ecosystem that has long departed from the illusion of needing to appeal to new players. Uh, for an example, here is a breakdown of what I need to do as a dancer main in order to excel in endgame content, sent to a backdrop of the BG Wiki article on haste caps and why you need to be aware of this otherwise hidden background mechanic. I'll provide the link. So, the obvious basic stuff is just figuring out your basic toolkit. Like, that's just learning how to macro certain things and when to use them, how to disengage or unlock a, off of an enemy to target the tank if you need to curing waltz. Obviously, curing waltz 3 is the most efficient, but in dire emergencies, you can use curing waltz 5. Then it's a simple matter of knowing which steps you want to presto, when to slip into saber dance for maximum hurt, master the elemental properties of your skill chains, manage your finisher points. That includes knowing when to use no foot rise, reverse climax, climactic flourish, and from there, it's a simple matter of tracking down the following uh, for your dream TP gear set. Remember, this is stuff you should hunt down after you've hunted down a starter and then a mid-tier set to keep you strong enough to grind out stuff to get to the dream stuff, right? Just get the Twashtar, your Empyrean weapon, which you unlock through the challenge content trial of the Magians and the Abyssia series of add-on content, which luckily enough also unlocks the Centovente, your other dagger that you need. Buy yourself an Oglamir Orb, plus one, going price about 65 million gil. Use an Abjuration on a Cursed uh, Helm to get an Adhamar Bonnet, and one on boots to get an Adhamar wrist, both plus one. Buy an Etoile Gorget, plus two, going price of about 45 million gil. The Sharita e earring farmed from an omen fight. Balder earring, plus one, another 70 mil. The Horus Cossack and shoes, plus three. Reforged relic gear, I haven't even started to try and sort out. Uh, Pona's ring, also from Abyssia. The gear ring from Walk of Echoes. Sununa's mantle, but not just any Sununa's mantle. You need to have your secondary attributes per perfectly attuned, and it says here on the guide that expert dancers should expect to make about six of this exact cape with subtly different attribute configurations. Uh, then buy a wind uh, a wind buffet belt, a wind buffet belt probably. Uh, plus one. Hey, that's only three mil. That's a steal and go through Sinister Rain for my Samuna tights. Easy. Only 17 more gear sets to go after that. Also, this guide is from 2019 and was edited as recently as 2020, so there are new weapons that were released that this guide hasn't even factored in. If that all seems like way too much to wrap your head around, be thankful that I only need to spend about six months committed effort towards grinding out one of my best weapons in the game, and that I really only need to do this maybe two or three times total, not counting the money and resource grind for all the other gear I laid out, and be thankful I didn't main Red Mage, where you're expected to have roughly 60 to 80 unique pieces of gear to be a fully optimal end game player. This is what I mean about this game. Divorced from the mechanical inhibitions, the obtuse guideposts, the relishing of making progression often obscure and reliant on arbitrary time seeks, FF11 is a culture, a 
people. They live and breathe Vanadiel, its intricacies, its mechanics, its own particularly bizarre cosmology and mysticism. One of the most deeply evocative and charming elements about Eleven is the seeming particularity around seemingly mundane items and their significance in quests, invoking the Final Fantasy of Eld with the rat tail as the secret to vast power. A bag of pebbles may be just the thing to weigh down a switch. A gemstone, long thought lost, is what you need to have to have someone teach you how to dance. A lantern can be filled with the flames of combat to forge feathers that you can cash in for a chance to fight Odin, bigger and stronger than before. The fate and mythic destiny ties itself time again to a game full of baubles, but the effect leaves the game feeling uh, hyper-fictional in a compelling way. See. Not to take a pot shot here, but a lot of people like to talk about how the world of World of Warcraft is a major character in itself, but the world of FF11 is no sludge to that kind of poetic musing. Unpacking the bespoke nature of this world requires patience and a strong community, and looking a lot of shit up on BG Wiki and waiting in-game days, hunting for weather patterns, answering inscrutable personality tests. But the world of the particular and mundane is, in a very real way, a path towards the abstract and divine. You can start a story with three lost kids, my least favorite characters in the game, and end it above the planet, fighting for a new future, a new mother crystal to be forged. You can fight Odin 12 real-life days in a row, once a day demanding that he release your friend from his servitude, an act so deeply exhausting and personally taxing that I shudder to remember it. But you can fight and win back a final farewell from him, the peace and closure of his soul finally at rest. It is a game built out of frustrations. Frustrations built from obscure pathways through this world, through endless guides about niche complex mechanics, frustrations of tedious time wasters, but ultimately a game that you cannot help but take in and love. You can witness it still, a fandom so alive that they resurrected their darling, their home, that they laugh and shoulder through the bad to reach through these profound, exhilarating goods. You are never going to be anything but an outsider, in the absolute. But the party you're crashing has exactly what it wants. So, what can we get from our digging? Our, our privilege as visitors is a game that shows a level of care on its own world that would put any modern MMO to shame. The double-edged sword of making the progression through this game almost prohibitively tedious is that the world feels significant in a real way. There is good cause to engage with a shocking amount of the world, even enough to redo the opening story in triplicate to get your capacity bonus, so you can do the post-leveling level grind to unlock secret post-item level item levels for some gear, some of which may even be useful. And in going through it, you can see the rough edges of a world genuinely unsure of your place in it. Racism exists in this game, and it exists in a way that seems systemically embedded. There's vanishingly few voices in the cast that care enough about the prejudice the Beast Tribes face in Venadiel to speak out on it, and those voices may be poignant in the moment, but insignificant as you travel 20 years into the past to be an instrument in the height of the war against the Beast Tribes anyway. You fight for the dignity and soul of the friends and heroes you get to know, but their actions are largely autonomous and significant. Lion gives herself up to save the world. Afnau must face and defeat her brother to spare him from his ambitions. You exist as an instrument of the will of heroes, your own values largely irrelevant to the will of the world. What could you hope to say in the face of Salteus as he sacrifices his autonomy and freedom to govern a new mother crystal, a new foundation to support the world? World of Warcraft, and even the later MMO Final Fantasy XIV, falls into the desire to turn your player character into a deified hero, like the others, to varying degrees of interest and success, but FF11 holds only the barest pretense. You're definitely regarded by some as a hero, but the world is so self-obsessed, so lost in its own mythos, that you seemingly only pres provide perspective to yourself. And that's maybe ultimately okay. You have to put yourself into it. Mechanically, narratively, thematically, this world is hostile. Not in the same way that Final Fantasy XIII's is, sure, but contrary to the series' usual openness, eagerness to invite you into these spaces, Eleven hits a kind of loose open-endedness that makes it feel more like a love letter to the fiction of a high fantasy adventure than even FF9 aspired to. And it's an idea that has not yet been re-examined. 
there is truly almost nothing in this world much like this particular game still running still holding up a vibrant obsessive community once you learn how to manage your haste caps grind out for mythic and empyrean weapons once you get your job cap mastered your merits points properly set once you do all the story quests and rhapsodies of nadiel your coalitions your assaults max your mod garden get your adolin ring this world is ready for you But before we move on to 12, I want to take a quick moment to shout out to this channel's sponsors. All of the names you see here on screen are supporters over on Patreon.com and here on YouTube as YouTube members. If you would like to support the channel and keep videos like this possible, please consider pledging as little as $1 a month on YouTube or Patreon. The links are in the description below. Not only did I skip out on 11, there was a brief moment where I seriously debated excluding Final Fantasy XII from this video as some sort of joke funny only to myself. The other option was reading the first 3300 words of the Wikipedia page as a Kaufman-esque April Fool's joke. I don't know if this video is even going to release on April 1st, and it seems, at least to me, ill-advised to just skip a game in a comprehensive video that many viewers are going to jump around in to hear about the games they want to hear about. This has nothing to do with the game's quality. As in all Final Fantasy games are good truther, the problem lies somewhere deeper. Final Fantasy 6 through 10 gave me instantaneous brain stimulation, while 12 inflamed my less thoughtful corporeal satisfaction. Exploring its dusty, arid world, frequently with the Zodiac Age's four times speed up engaged, I felt incredible separation from the world of Evilus. I played the game on Switch. My experience of Final Fantasy XII came complete with VHS grime from the speed up and small screen. Sitting in a trashy Holiday Inn that didn't have any of the cable channels advertised, I hooked up XII through an HDMI to composite splitter and felt the fuzz of that old 13-inch TV over the scrambling image. It made Evilus feel lost to time, even as the cup of the game overfloweth with the drink of modern video games. It was released, somehow, the same year as Gears of War, and heralded the age of the modern RPG. While 12 didn't popularize an entirely new approach to its genre like Gears of War did, it's a prolific step in the metamorphosis undergone by RPGs in the 21st century. Whatever invisible line that separates Final Fantasy X from The Witcher 3 was crossed by 12. I won't spend much more time historicizing Final Fantasy XII and the grand narrative of RPGs. After all, this isn't a video about the history of RPGs. For my purposes, it's best to see XII in the context of the Final Fantasy series. As Final Fantasy transitioned back to single player from the MMO dungeons of XI, XII represents a key turning point in the franchise into its current form. Random encounters are completely gone, and turn-based combat is nominally removed. Functionally, the game's combat is the same as Final Fantasy VI through IX, with the ATB bar making a comeback, but the addition of automated combat through the Gambit system, the inclusion of free roam during combat, and area of effect spells flavor the turn-based combat in XII to taste like the increasingly popular action and real-time role-playing combat of the 2000s. This is also the first Final Fantasy game to include modern MMO-style side quests with its monster hunts, a sequence of quests where the player is tasked with killing an increasingly difficult procession of monsters roaming throughout the world of Ivalice. Monster hunts will continue into future games, featuring in 13, 15, and 16, and probably 14, but that game's not my responsibility for this video, so I didn't look it up. The modern combat and side quests made 12, stuck up there on a hotel CRT, feel both trapped in the past and ahead of its time. That's why I struggled for so long to write about this game. 
Moving beyond my visceral reaction to playing the game and focusing on how I played and grappling with the game's themes and mechanics on a deeper level, the way I did for all the previous games, asked me to really chew the cut of 12. For the series itself, The Hunt and 12 are the series' first single-player break from the travelogue structure that served as the crawlspace and air ducts of the first 10 games. And so 12 is where I say the era of modern Final Fantasy begins, opposed to 7, which primarily changed the series through aesthetic features like 3D graphics and being incredibly popular, and 10, which held on to enough of the old ways of designing side quests despite being a fully linear game for the majority of its playtime. This isn't to say that 12 is a clean break from Final Fantasy of old. It carries the proud, erect torch of the series' horniness more boldly than any game since 10. But unlike 10, which felt a little embarrassed about its neurotic obsession with Lulu's cleavage, a topic that's come up multiple times now for no particular reason, 12 is unashamed, kneeling at the altar of steady cam ass shots of skimpy princesses and bunny girls, with a confidence unmistakable from the rest of mid-2000s scuzz marketed to dudes named Brett and Landon. 12 also continues the series tradition of grounding its main characters in the existential questions that have driven every game in the series since 4. The main character of 12, Vaughn, is a controversial protagonist amongst Final Fantasy enthusiasts because Vaughn is almost entirely plot irrelevant after several hours. It's an interesting problem that 12 proposes because it violates many people's gut reaction to what a protagonist should be. This isn't the only time Final Fantasy has had a protagonist that's tangentially related to the plot, but most of the other major examples like Bartz and Zidane are given significance by having internal conflicts that map directly onto the overt themes of their games. Vaughn doesn't have that, and he also doesn't get cosmic levels of significance by being the son or brother of more interesting people. Familial significance is granted Vaughn, but it's in the reverse. His brother Rex, the game's fake-out protagonist, is killed instantly. A terrible fate for a guy named Rex, doomed to an eternity of suffering the same joke from a million Final Fantasy XII videos, and a real bummer, because he's just a regular guy who dies. He's not a god, or an idolon, or a secret prince. He's just a dead guy, like every nameless NPC from Nine. Vaughn being a random guy, without any significance to the world spiritually or politically, is viewed by many as a mechanical error in the storytelling, but I'm here to say proudly that Vaughn works as a lead, because he isn't really a main character. Vaughn is a POV character in the vein of Ishmael and Captain Walton. He's the player's humble, low-born eyes that filter a story that's true scope would be restricted by following Ash or Bosch or Balthier as the POV. Veterans of the Final Fantasy VIII section will remember that I yammered briefly about Moby Dick, and against the better judgment of YouTube marketability, I think I'll do it again. Ishmael, the narrator of Moby Dick, gives the reader a wider view of the story. For us to truly appreciate the scope and nature of Captain Ahab's madness, we view him through the outside eyes that have minimal impact on the plot itself. Ishmael's motivation to set sail is to quell the damp, drizzly November in my soul. In his journey to the sea, in his quest for adventure, Ishmael assembles the vagabond JRPG party of the Pequod from himself to Ahab and Starbuck and Queequeg that bring the reader along the mad quest for the White Whale. It's also Ishmael's perspective that allows it to not just be a revenge story, but also a prose poem of the sea and a science textbook. Final Fantasy XII is likewise telling a story that's so large it needs a set of eyes that gives us a wider view of the world and narrative. And Final Fantasy XII does care about having a large world. The game has recurring narration taken from the fictional book Memoirs of Marquis Hallamondor IV, with the opening narration taken from Chapter 12 of that fake book, implying a much wider history for this world than even our homely Vaughn can see. Ivalice, the continent that Final Fantasy XII takes place in, is rare, because unlike other worlds in the series, it recurs outside of Final Fantasy XII and its direct sequel Revenant Wings. Ivalice is the setting of the Final Fantasy Tactics subseries, appears in Final Fantasy XIV, and even in the non-Final Fantasy PS1 RPG Vagrant story. In XII's bite-sized slice of Ivalisian history, the Arcadian Empire conquers the much smaller Dalmasca. As there tends to be in Final Fantasy, there are other fantastical terrors. Final Fantasy IX and Sixteenian horrors stick their fingers into the steam vents, turning Ivalice into a pressure bomb, but that'll be important later. At the simplest level of Rebels vs. Empire, Vaughn and his childhood friend Pinello give the player the on-the-ground reality. 
in the early hours of the game, we get held up at Imperial checkpoints. We need to run petty errands to bypass the sanctions and inspections that have slowed down food distribution in the city. We have to attend hand-waving Imperial parades and get involved in the literal underworld of Vaughn's hometown of Robin Oster. The texture of Ivalice's dusty western towns is developed in these early hours by following this well-meaning vagabond. As 12 is a story of revolutionary anti-colonialism, if we want to make it sound real nice and fancy, it's important for the game to have Vaughn and Pinello who are, in part, motivated to save their homeland because it's their home, not because it's their fate or their chivalric duty. Final Fantasy XV tells a similar story, but it's told entirely from the perspective of its hero king, and the consequence is a fragmented narrative. It will work really well for that game, but that's not the aesthetic 12 wants. It wants comprehensive cleanliness. Which is why, like 6, 12 opts for an ensemble cast. The playable cast beyond Vaughn and Pinello, Ash, Bosch, Fran, and Balthier all offer unique glimpses into the world of Evilis and the problems that preoccupy its peoples. In gameplay, 12 has no individual character required to be in the party at all times, and while that has become the norm from 10 onwards, it's salient in 12 because this isn't any one character's story. The latter half of 12 becomes Ash's story, and because of that, some people argue that Ash would have been the better pick as a main character. But Ash is the final playable character we get control of, and her political significance as Princess of the Conquered Dalmasca doesn't paint that full-bodied picture of Ivalice that 12 wants. If we ignore the concept of an individual protagonist and treat each character as people within a larger system, we see that each of them contends with different problems present in Ivalice. For example, Fran is a Viera, a race of all-female bunny girls who live in isolated villages, separate from the human realms of Ivalice. Fran leaves her home village against the wishes of her sister to see the rest of Ivalice. During the story, Fran goes insane from the mist, a magical energy that pours from the earth. Her berserk state and the danger that poses to herself and everyone else lets us see the threat that Arcadia poses not just to Dalmasca, but to the planet itself. The Viera have a deeper connection to the Earth, living in the forests and the trees instead of the human metropolises that turn the Earth into industry and war. This threat, this unseen danger of Arcadia's conquest of Ivalice, is seen through Fran, and it's these wrinkles, these incomplete different perspectives brought by the playable characters that form the tapestry of Ivalice. Despite its many changes, 12 maintains the series' preoccupation with existential themes. To finish covering Vaughn before moving on, complaints against him in particular tend to focus on his lack of a motivation to be involved in the story. The Dalmascan throne isn't his kingship to reclaim, nor is he a betrayed knight restoring his honor. His brother was a nobody, and he is a nobody, and that's what makes Vaughn interesting, not just as an Ishmaelian POV character, but as a personality. Unlike previous Final Fantasy protagonists, he has to construct his own motivation. Without the divine rights of kings to pull him through the narrative or being trapped in an isekai world, Vaughn seeks adventure and freedom. He wants to save his country from imperial rule. As a lowborn citizen, his life isn't going to be very different under Arcadian or Dalmascan rule. Either way, he's going to be a delivery boy selling mud steaks and sand wine for Magello, but that's not enough. He wants to be a sky pirate, and the idea of becoming something more than a delivery boy and saving his nation are worth going on this journey, even if the higher stakes are out of his reach. Ash, likewise, is also burdened by intrinsic questions of purpose as much as by the extrinsic driver of being the rightful heir to the Dalmascan throne. The dark sky that looms invisibly over Ivalice is the gods of Ivalice, the Acuria, a cadre of eternal beings like Final Fantasy IX Garland and the upcoming Ultima and XVI that want to shape the world in their image. Ash's material conflict is driving out the Empire from Dalmasca, which is what the Acuria want. Her internal conflict is that she wants the world free from Acurian influence, which is what the Arcadian Emperor Vane wants. This isn't a catch-22, it's not one way or the other, rather it's a delicate balancing act that Ash has to navigate. The challenge for her is acting prudently and without rashness. There are several easier options given to her to stop Arcadia, but they give the Acuria power. It matters to Ash, because her dream is self-determination, freedom of humanity from all tyrants, human or otherwise. She wants people to be free to drive their own history. 
In a way, it's hopelessly naive, and not truly achievable under the hereditary monarchy she will rule, or perhaps under any socio-political organization. But it's better. It's a step outside of the false choice between Vane and the Acuria, which results in subjugation by a different subjugator. In her own way, Ash is confronted with the same problem as Titus. How does she end an endless cycle? How does she overthrow cycles of tyranny? Because 12 mechanically emphasizes walking this big, open world, warp points are rare and use items, the answer to solving this problem is appropriately more adventurous than the spiritual answers in 10. What binds our heroes together is that they're all outsiders to this dichotomy of Arcadia and Acuria. Vaughn and Pinello seek to become sky pirates, Balthier and Fran work outside the loyalties of nation states, and Bosch is an accused traitor to Dalmasca. They aren't outsiders in the sense of being social outcasts or beatniks or anything, but because they seek lives and purpose that don't simply get along to get along with the Vaney and Acurian orders. Even as the plot relevance of characters waxes and wanes through the story, their individuality never does. Look at this late game cutscene where Ash and Balthier discuss serious matters for serious people. Lusting for ever greater power. Blinded by the Nethesite. Is that how you see me? That does sound like someone I know. He was obsessed with Nethesite. It was all he cared about. Come over here. He'd here. babble nonsense, hey! blind to aught but the Watch stone's it. power. The details don't matter. What I locked in on is how, during this conversation, Vaughn and Pinello are sitting on the beach, roughhousing and playing in the sand. Even through all the battles and the blood and the tears, they're still kids. And when I look at Balthier and Ash, I can't help but notice how bad all the characters look. Not graphically. Final Fantasy XII is one of the great achievements of PlayStation 2 hardware. Rather, everyone has sunken eyes. Their skin and hair are faded. Compare the popping pinks and blues of Ash's concept art to her in-game model. She looks tired and worn down in a way characters in this series rarely do. Everyone in 10, 13, and 15 looks certified anime beautiful. Part of this is a changing character designer. Tetsuya Nomura is the mall goth designer of the other games, while 12 was designed by Akihiko Yoshida, whose body of work includes the darker, rougher, earthen designs of Vagrant Story and Tactics Ogre. The characters dress as flamboyantly in 12 as they do in the other games, but even in a scene as quiet and unremarkable as the one we just watched, they look as if they're being sucked into the muck of the world a sickness that never infects the moist, gleaming bodies in 15. On a certain level, 12 was the Final Fantasy I was the least captivated by narratively, but its grime and fatigue gripped me unlike any other world in the series. You have to walk everywhere. You double back around to repeated locations and you scrounge shitty randomized MMO loot from every corner of every godforsaken dungeon in the hellhole of Ivalice, and the world is felt underneath each of those infinite footsteps kicking up the dust and the sand. There's an artificiality to 10 and later 13 because there's always high walls and bottomless pits flanking you at all sides, unlike the open, free roam areas of 12. There's a great moment where you walk into a real rotten zone and Bosch looks into the distance and says, we had best fuck off. And I did, and I never returned because th that place looked scary. I only spent 27 hours in 12. I didn't do many side quests, I bulldozed the main story as always, but even in my limited time, it's the game I hanker to go back to the most, just to look at and run around in from story beat to story beat. I like to run around in this world, even if I smash the Zodiac Age speed up button each time a fight starts. The reason I skipped many of the side quests wasn't just because I have to constantly fight the incantations of the completionist demons that infect my head. Like I'd mentioned earlier, the side quests in 12 are primarily monster hunts, explicit combat challenges that reward the player with increasing generosity as the monsters become bigger, tougher, and more resilient. For some players, the shift from the weird Golvarian side quests of the PS1 trilogy in 10 will be great because those side quests tend to suck mechanically, but the hunts that will now dominate the rest of the series do very little for me as you really need a lot of intrinsic motivation for the combat in these games that I don't have. It's not the game's problem, it's my problem. But from here on out, I do miss all the weird freaky stuff these games used to offer by means of side quests. 
If the gameplay of 12 marks the first move away from the travelogue quest structure, then the story of 12 is the final time the travelogue structure will be used for the characters. After 12, the series will mostly drop the travelogue influence, shifting focus to making sure that the playable characters in the following games always have direct relevance to the plot. When we get to 13, it's clear that neither approach is inherently better than the other, although the shift to every playable character having constant plot relevance has its own cost, with the playable cast shrinking in size from 6 to 4 and down to 1 in the journey from 13 to 16. And the first step on that journey, Final Fantasy 13, is one I'm very excited to take. Vaughn, the Strahl's in your hands. You'd better take care of her, you hear? There's one scratch on her when I get back. Roger that. We'll be waiting for you.